Every Sunday was the same routine. Family would get up, they'd put on their Sunday best, and they would start walking down the street to each of the churches that they attended. The first stop, they'd wave bye to grandma and grandpa as they would go into the church that they had joined. Then a block later, they would wave bye to mom and son as they would go into the church that they had joined. And then finally, the dad and the daughter would go into the church that they had joined. And after this went on for some time, finally the, the daughter looked up to the dad after the first two stops and said, I sure wish Jesus had just made one church so that we could all worship together. The next question I'm going to have on this next slide is one that was actually raised by some members of this congregation, and I want us to consider it very carefully because we all need to have the answer to this question, and that is, is there just one right church, or does the wonderful, amazing grace of God extend to those in many types of churches with many types of faiths and variations in their works and their styles, but they all call upon the name of the Lord? We learned on Wednesday night that there is an objective standard. There is a supreme authority by which we must follow. And so we need to follow that authority. We need to look to the word for the answers to that question. To study about the church that Jesus established. Who it is, what it does, and why it matters so much, not only for our service here on earth, but because it matters so much to our soul for eternity. And I preach this sermon not to be exclusionary by any means. I love the church that Jesus established. And I want us all to love it. And I want us all to be united and to have confidence and have our calling and election sure so we can all stand as we will in front of God one day on the day of judgment and hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter the joy of your Lord. And so I'll start here with the seed principle, and this is borrowed from Brother Glenn Colley in Huntsville, Alabama. He says, you know, when he was in elementary school, he planted a seed or a bean with seed in it inside soil. Many of you may have done the same thing. You take a cup, you take soil in it, and you put a bean in there and cover it. And what do you do next? You water it regularly and give it ample sunlight. And over time, over some weeks, that seed begins to sprout out of the bean. And it uh, supports, has a roots to support it, and it has a stem that arises from the soil, and pretty soon you see leaves that sprout from it, and eventually it sprouts beans. You wouldn't expect it to sprout any other thing. It's beans, because that's what's in the seed. How about squash? You plant a squash seed, and it comes up yellow squash. A year from now, if you plant that seed, it should still come up yellow squash, right? With the same look and taste and feel as if you had planted it today. Well, how about if you were able to perfectly preserve that seed for five years and plant it? It still should come up yellow squash. Bear with me here. How about if we were able to perfectly preserve it for 2,000 years? If we were able to do that, then our descendants should be able to use that seed and plant it and come up with squash that has the same look and taste and feel as if we had planted it today. Friends, Luke chapter 8, Jesus says, The seed is God's word, and the soil are the hearts of men. Do we still have the seed today? Yes. Do we still have hearts of men today, the soil? Yes. In Acts chapter 2, on Jesus' name, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. The people were pricked their hearts, the soil, and Peter said, Arise, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And 3,000 people were baptized from that seed. And you say, well, that was 2,000 years ago. Surely things have changed. Surely that seed has been corrupted. I would take you to 1 Peter 1.23. It says, we've been born again, not of perishable seed, corruptible seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. That seed is still here. It has been perfectly preserved. And if we take that imperishable seed and plant it in our own hearts and in the hearts of others, we still should be able to get the same type of plant, the same church that Peter planted there in the first century. And that should be our goal. That should be our mission. Not what we want, but what Jesus wanted, what, he was founded, what the church was founded on, on him. That's our mission. So when was this church established? Let's go back in time to our Bible reading. 
Matthew 16. Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And of course, his disciples say, well, some say it's John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah. But Jesus says, who do you, my followers, say that I am? And Simon stood up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, your name shall now be Peter, which means rock. Because upon that rock, upon that bedrock fact that I am the Christ, the Son of God, I will build my church. It's his church, number one, and it is a church, singular, number two. It's singular. He says, I will build my church. I'm here this morning to tell you Jesus only built one church, one body. Ephesians 4, 4 through 5, you'll love this. There is one body, right? One spirit. One hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The very first one is one body. Very clear about that. And to kind of tweak it and say, well, there, there can be more than one bodies. We might as well go and say there's more than one Lord, more than one faith, more than one baptism. The Bible's clear. There's one body. Add that to the, a few passages over in the same book, Ephesians 5. Christ is the Savior of the body. Same letter, the body is the church. Ephesians 1, 22 through 23. So if there's one body and Christ is the savior of the body and the body is the church, there's only one uh, conclusion that we can draw from Ephesians and that is Christ is the savior of his one church. And that's why we do the things we do here. It's not out of personal preference. It's not out of tradition. It's out of principle. It's out of submission to the one who established his church and the one who has the keys to our salvation. So what truly distinguishes this church? And the answer is, it's in Christ. Remember Matthew 16, the rock that, upon which his church was built was that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in whom? In Christ. Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Well, if in Christ there is no condemnation, I don't want to be outside of Christ. Galatians 3, 26 to 27, for in Christ Jesus, you were all sons of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And why is it so important? Why is in Christ, in Christ, in Christ really emphasized in Scripture? Is because Acts 4, 12, there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. It has to be in Christ. It has to be in his church that was founded on his name. And it's because it's where the blood is. Ephesians 1, 7, sinners are saved in him by the blood of Jesus. The blood is in his body. Christ has the sphere of his church, his body, and that's where his blood is. The blood still courses through the body. And you must be a part of the body, access to the blood, access to the nutrients in order to have the blood of Jesus, in order to have that cleansing. I can tell you I'm a physician by trade. I do biopsies every day. We take tissue that has access to the blood in a body, and extract that tissue, and put it over in a container. And while it's in the body with access to the blood, it continues to grow, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. But when we extract it from the body, away from the blood supply, and put it in a container, it begins to die because it must be in the body, it must have access to the blood. And Hebrews 9.14 is not just any blood. The blood of bulls and goats can't do it. It has to be the sacrifice of Jesus. John 1.7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. I love this verse. Let's start with the beginning of it. If we walk in the light. Church, who is the light according to John 1? It's Jesus. He's called the true light. That same chapter calls Jesus the Word. So if we walk in the light, in the true light of Jesus, the Word of God, and as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another because we're all following the same pattern in the light. And if we do that, we're a member of the body, the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. But we must walk in the light. The actionable word there is if. The grace of God is wonderful. It provided this blood for us to have. But we've got to walk in the light. Many of you would understand this particular illustration. Take yourselves back into school, 
and you're sitting in, the, in a classroom setting, and the teacher comes to you along with the other students and says, here is a book report assignment due tomorrow, but here is the outline for it I want you to follow. And as long as you follow this outline I'm handing you right now, you will get an A, I promise you. You will pass this class, and you will graduate. So if you're like me, when you go home that day, you're going to keep the outline very close to your chest, as many other students in the class would. And you go home, and you put that outline right next to your pen and paper or computer, and you follow that outline as close as you possibly can. Because the teacher promised, if you follow that outline, you'll get that A. You'll pass that class. The next morning, you turn in your book report, and you're smiling because you have confidence because of what the teacher told you. You have a reasonable expectation, according to her promise or his promise, that you will receive that A. Now imagine the night before, when you're working on your report, one of your fellow students calls you up and says, you'll never believe this. My family just got the newest computer system, the newest printer, and it has a whole new section for book reports, right? It's not exactly the outline the teacher gave us, but it's so much better. It has a different texture it can put on the paper, all different kinds of colors and shapes. It is going to be fantastic. I love it, and I know the teacher will too. What kind of advice would you give to your fellow student in that case? My advice would go something like this. I would say, friend, that book report may look fantastic to you, and it may look fantastic to the teacher. She has the ability to give you that A if she wants to. She has the ability to pass you if she wants to. But why take that chance? Why not just follow the outline the teacher gave? Then you'd be assured that you can pass the class. And we want you to walk with us on the day of graduation, go into the next class together. Why take the chance? Just follow the outline. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's the promise given to us by God. Just follow the outline. What do we know about this church? Let's go back, take ourselves back to the first century. If we could somehow time travel back to the day of Pentecost when Peter preached that sermon. And we were able to find one of those 3,000 people who were baptized. And we go up to him and he's still soaking wet. And we say, what happened to you, sir? And he says, I was just baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of my sins. And you say, oh, wonderful. So which denomination are you going to join? I don't believe he's going to know what you're talking about. Because he was baptized into Jesus. It's not his preference. It's Jesus. Denominations would come much, much later. How about if we ask a group of believers today? Let's say that after church services, a group came into the building and said, we believe in God and Jesus. We believe in a heaven and hell. We believe there's a church, and we want to learn about this church so we can be added to it. And let's say all we gave them, all we gave them was a New Testament. And we had them go into a room, and they took sufficient time and just studied the New Testament, which is our new covenant in Christ. And they came out, and they were smiling, and they said, we are ready. We know what we need to do. We said, okay, go ahead. We'll watch. Here's what I believe that those new readers of the New Testament would do. We believe that they would meet together, as they, as they read in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, that they would be baptized and baptized for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. They would baptize by immersion, Acts 8. They would take the Lord's Supper every Sunday, 1 Corinthians 11. They would sing with their hearts, Ephesians 5.19, and with the fruit of their lips, Hebrews 13.15. And if somebody offered them an instrument for worship, they would say no, because while they did have instruments in that day, we remember reading that in Matthew 9, 23, they used it for a funeral service, but we never find an example of where they used it in worship. So no, thank you. We're going to sing as commanded with our hearts and with our lips. They would give of their means, Acts chapter 5. They would have male elders and deacons, Titus 1, male leadership in the assembly, 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 12. They would serve their community, and others, 1 Peter 4.10. Practice church discipline, 1 Corinthians 5. Call themselves Christians, Acts 11.26. And they would evangelize this area and praise God despite the threats of persecution, Acts chapter 16. That's what they would do. And I believe they would be following the pattern by doing that. And for those who may prefer a little extra biblical evidence for this, Justin Martyr, who was born around 100 AD, so this is about the time the Apostle John died, 
But he's writing about the church at that time, at the very end of the first century, beginning of the second century. See if this sounds familiar to you. He says, On Sunday, a meeting is held of all who live in the cities and villages, and a section is read from the memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets as long as time permits. And when the reading is finished, the leader in discourse gives the admonition and exhortation to imitate these noble things. And after this, we offer a common prayer. And after the, closing, after the prayer, the bread and wine and thanks are distributed, and we say amen. And the consecrated elements are then given to each one to partake of and carry to the houses of the absent. And then the wealthy and the willing then give contributions according to their free will. And the collection is deposited to supply orphans and widows and prisoners and strangers and all those who are in want. That sounds so familiar. It's because that's what the church in the first, first century did, according to what we read. And that's what we try to do here every Sunday. We try to follow the pattern, follow the outline. You'll recognize this picture, many of you, because it was taken just behind us here in the yard several years ago. In this church, we follow a pattern. Again, not because it's tradition, because it's the way we've always done it. It's because of whose church it is, because we want to obey Jesus Christ because of the church that he established. And I don't want you to get the impression that it's workspace, that just because of what we do earns our salvation. But by any means, the majority of it is because of the grace of God. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. If we took a pie chart, the vast majority of it would be because of God's grace. A tiny, tiny little sliver would be what he tells us to do, our obedience to him, if we walk in the light. Matthew 7 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So the grace covers the vast majority of it. All we have to do is use our own free will to obey God in order to ensure our, our salvation, to make our calling and election sure. And it's not, it's not that we have to understand God's reasoning. You may look at that list I gave just a little while ago about what the New Testament church would do, and you may say, well, that is what happened 2,000 years ago. That's so old-fashioned. Times have changed. I don't understand why God would want us to do that. Surely God is not interested in those little details. And what I would say is the pattern is important. God does care about the details and his commands for us. And if you want to ask, ask the Israelites, who back in Exodus maybe didn't understand why they had to kill an unblemished male lamb and put the blood on their doorposts. But the ones who did it, they had their lives saved, the firstborn saved the next morning. And those who didn't do it, maybe because they didn't understand, they didn't. They had their firstborn die that night. Ask Nadab and Abihu, but we built fire, Lord, but it wasn't the kind of fire that the Lord had commanded. It was strange fire, and they lost their lives. Saul, I want you to kill all the Amalekites. Yes, Lord. So Saul killed most of the Amalekites, but saved the king and saved some of the cattle and the herds. Samuel confronted him about it, and he said, well, I know what God told me, but I wanted to do it this way so that I could sacrifice the rest to God and be pleasing to him. And Samuel said, no, you don't do it your way, you do it God's way. To obey is better than sacrifice. That's what he said. And Saul lost his kingship because he didn't follow God. And ask Cornelius, if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. I want you to imagine that Cornelius is alive today in Fort Mill, in our community. And I want you to think about what the area, the, the region around here would think about Cornelius if this happened to him today. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man, one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Boy, if he was in this community, people would say he's the model Christian. Surely he saved that devout man who prays to God always, who fears God and give alms to the people. Then why, I ask you, did God send Peter to Cornelius to baptize he and his household and add them to the church? Because until that happened, Cornelius was outside of the church. He needed to be in the body, no matter how good he was outside the body. And parents, we need to teach our children, and it begins with us being good examples. We want them to love the scriptures, to love the church that Jesus established, but we must love the church that Jesus established as well. 
Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Train them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. It starts with us. Emphasize scripture with them. Emphasize what the Lord commanded because they'll have peer pressures. If, if they haven't already, they will. And their friends will want them to do things that are outside of the authorized word of God. And it may seem wonderful to them. And their friends will say, this will make you feel so much closer to Christ if you just do this. And what our kids need to say is, while you may have some type of emotional reaction to that, we need to follow the scripture. John 1 says, the, fl- the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word is Jesus. Jesus is the word. You cannot get closer to Jesus by walking away from the word. You have to stay close to the word. And as far as reaching the lost, all of us, I'm sure, in here have members who may at one time have been a part of the body. Maybe now they're not. Maybe they're outside of the body. They may be attending a denomination elsewhere. And it is very easy, and, and I understand the sentiment. I, I definitely understand. It comes from a place of love where we may say, well, at least they're going somewhere. At least they're going somewhere. Again, that comes from a place of love, and I understand that. I would just caution us to make sure we don't give degrees of distinction outside of the body that the Bible doesn't give. Don't become complacent. While they still have breath, while they still have life, we can, we can bring them back to the body, and we should. And we should pray for them and make sure they come back. But keep praying for them and keep reaching out. They need to be in the body of Christ. And it all starts with getting back to the seed. We've got to get back to the Word of God. That seed that was planted 2,000 years ago, that imperishable seed, we need to get back to it. Make sure that's what's in our hearts and that's what grows because that's what's in the seed. Remember that little girl who said, Daddy, I sure wish that Jesus just made one church so we could all worship together? According to the Word of God and what we've read this morning, our authorized standard? Yes, Jesus did. There is just one right church, and it's the church that Jesus established. And some might say, boy, that's rigid. Boy, that is inflexible. I don't want to be a member of that church of don'ts. doesn't sound like you have much freedom. But I'll tell you, it's just the opposite of that. You have all the freedom in the world because we, it's a church of do's. We do get to do what Christ said to do. That's the freedom we have. If you're out in a boat in the ocean and you don't have a rudder and you don't have sails and the wind and the waves are tossing you to and fro, that's not freedom. That's chaos. It's when you have the rudder and you have those sails and you have the word of God, our truth, and when you have Jesus as our guide to take us to the shore, that's when you have freedom, folks, because we have the truth. And Jesus said the truth sets us free. That's the word of God. This morning, if you have not been baptized, according to the word, we must be immersed. In just a moment, we'll sing an invitation song. You can come forward. We'll immerse you into Christ, symbolizing his death, burial, and resurrection. And you can be added to the body of Christ this morning. If you've already been baptized, but you've been outside of the light, outside of the church, and you want to get back in, I implore you, come forward in just a moment. We'll pray with you and for you to help get your life back on track. I urge you, please, be part of the church that Jesus established. We come. I need.